Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii on Monday, November the 22nd, 2021. This is uh, this show is the state of the state of Hawaii and it broadcasts every other Monday. I'm your show host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Today, our topic is media ratings, and we have an expert guest to discuss um, media ratings from their origins in the last century when television was first introduced, or maybe not even at first, maybe later, but she will tell us more about that. And, uh, and, and, and we have about almost a century of history on this industry's development. Our guest has studied and researched and published on, on media ratings as uh, she was a professor at the University of Missouri. And she's also taught at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey. But well, we welcome uh, Dr. Karen Buzzard as our guest today. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Stephanie. Nice to be here. Well, thanks for participating in, in Think Tech. And, and certainly thank you for being on this show and taking the time uh, in your in your schedule, um, it's a, it's always a great gift. Thanks. Um, uh, now, and getting to know you has been fun too. Since we've been talking about the show, I've come to call you Karen. Is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> I'm retired, so. <laughs> okay, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> they saved me from the courtesies. Okay, good. Um, why don't you um, say a few things to us about how you got interested in, in the topic of media ratings? Well, I got interested when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin working on my uh, PhD. And uh, I was had finished my classwork and was looking around for a topic for my dissertation. And uh, sort of serendipitously, a uh, head of TAF Broadcasting, a gentleman came through who had graduated from the University of Wisconsin, and he was looking for students to work at, at Broadcasting. So uh, all the students, of course, lined up, and he selected me to be director of research at uh, what was then WTAF Television in Philadelphia. So uh, I became uh, experienced then uh, as director of research there working with uh, the rating system, particularly uh, Nielsen, Arbitron, were the two key rating services. Nielsen did the national ratings, as they were called, and uh, Arbitron and Nielsen at that time split the uh, local television ratings market. So basically there were two sets of ratings uh, that we got, which were the national ratings and the local ratings. So that's kind of how I got involved by working there. And then when it came time to um, write my dissertation, which I had left what they say ABD of a dissertation, I decided to be sort of a detective because a lot of the determin uh, terminology that we were using uh, on ratings hadn't uh, really been given a history. So I decided to kind of track down the figures, which some of which were, I was lucky you still alive at that point, this was the 80s, early 80s. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to interview um, some of the very first rating uh, companies and the um, gentleman who had started them, uh, such as Archibald Crosley, who actually was the very first rating rater and invented the term rating. Well, before we go on to um, the, the heroes, the pioneers, and the specifics, um, what, what did people think a media rating was then? And, and, and if that's a, is that a, a question that's meaningful? Yes, well, actually, the ratings, uh, if you uh, really started with radio, uh, it was in the 20s and 30s that the rating system started. And it was a kind of a joint venture at that time between advertisers who wanted to know what kind of audience they were getting for their products for buying television and broadcasters who wanted to know uh, how, how their programs were rating or how they, you know, so they could sell the program to advertisers. So it was a sort of joint venture. And in terms of different types of ratings, I think 
is a rating is always the percent of some base. So not all bases are the same. So you have to kind of look to see if the bases are comparable. Like for example, today, uh, Netflix uses its subscribers as a base, whereas um, the television marketplace and cable use the uh, what's called the number of uh, TV households. So there's something like 350,000 TV viewers today, which becomes the base for their ratings. So they're not really comparable unless you look at to see if the bases are comparable. Okay, so when these were were inaugurated, um, this was about the, mostly the, the advertisers, right? So this was mostly about- Primarily uh, the advertisers at the time. And if you look at uh, radio and early television, it was the advertisers who did the programming for uh, radio and early television. They sponsored the programs. A lot of the sets at the time in radio and television had what they call a sponsor's booth on the set where they would uh, have the people in production sit in and watch what was being produced. And if you recall, you know, the, the uh, advertisements were inserted right into the program where they would interrupt the program and the um, one of the actors would um, give a commercial inside the program. So oh, that was where so they would interrupt this program right right, right. <laughs> a launch of a missile or something but yeah okay well so are you telling me that like for what can i remember from back then? i mean like what a program like Avalon cassidy or the or the honeymooners or jack benny or what you, can you give us some examples is that those programs actually had their uh, yeah a lot of them just had a, what they call the single sponsor so the sponsor produced the whole program so they would interrupt the program uh, let's say like Gunsmoke was brought to you by um, some cigarette company. I forgot what, which one it was, but uh, they would interrupt the program and give you an ad for a commercial with cigarettes. So, and earlier, even before that on radio, they would have the actor, you know, stop and then, you know, talk about um, the cigarette. So it sort of gradually became uh, inserted into the program. And then uh, eventually they moved to uh, what the, the method we do today, which is where they insert multiple commercials in a program. It's no longer tied to a single sponsor. Okay, so Karen, on the then the, the qualities or the um, the uh, censoring. I mean, at that time, they were looking out on behalf of their product. They were working to get the best information about how that product could be made more attractive through these commercials and a better program to lure the audience and then they'd be able to sell more people okay right. now weren't there other things that were protecting the values that were expressed in the program i mean like wasn't there more censorship like did they do anything more than the product did they worry about language and you know oh yes they were much um they had very strict um censorship rules about what could and could not be shown on television you know things like um like similar to television where you, or to, to movies where you had to have you know uh you couldn't be laying in bed you had to have one foot on the floor that kind of thing um so they had uh censorship rules uh which were provided by the usually the broadcast networks offered the censorship so they oversaw them to make sure that you know they were on the um presenting uh, what they considered moral standards at that time. Okay, so on those moral standards, and we're sort of talking about there was a framework around the programming, right, already that these these advertisers may or may not have had um, participation in, right? Okay, right. but it's right. it a kind of, you know, forecasting to like talking about now where you know some of these things have gone away, but they were there they're pretty much in place, right? Like you couldn't right. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I was interested to know. And so then, um, okay. So did the audiences, did people know about media ratings? Were, were, who used, who used these early ones? How did they? Well, the, uh, first, I think public uh, kind of interest in the ratings was under a, um, ratings company called, um, Hooper ratings, which was the prominent rating service during the heyday of network radio. Uh, days, you know, radio programs like Fibber McGee and Molly and uh, the Lone Ranger. So, uh, Hooper uh, invented what were called coincidental ratings, which were calling in coincident with the program, called when the program was on, 
to see what people were watching. They were sort of considered the gold standard for that time. And uh, so uh, basically uh, it was Hooper who began the uh, idea of releasing these. He was a great marketer to the press. So he released the top 10 programs, you know, this week or whatever to the press. So they would get um, kind of marketing and uh, kind of uh, information that the public would want to know what programs were the most popular. Were there any data collected on who these viewers were? Did they do anything to find out more? Well, than uh, yes, originally the data collection was just sort of random. They would use viewer letters, that kind of thing. But eventually they moved to sampling, different types of sampling. And actually it's sort of interesting. The rating companies grew up alongside survey sampling at the same time was growing as a field. So originally the early raters used something called quota sampling and which was not, um, basically you couldn't project that to an to a audience. But when Nielsen came along, he, his big breakthrough uh, was in radio and then later television, he used random sampling, which was meaning that uh, the sample number could be projected to the entire TV population. So if you had a five rating, it would be 5% of the total TV population. So. That was sort of his invention, this, or his uh, use of uh, random sampling really kind of put him on the map and um, it allowed him to sell audiences by what's called cost per thousand. So uh, it tied uh, audiences to a type of currency, if you will, for ratings. So uh, audience could be bought and sold based on the currency of the ratings. Okay, so then that means he was looking at he was sampling from the viewer population? That's yes, he would. Well, he collected the number of television households there were in the US, the number of people that had televisions in their homes and use that as the base for his ratings. Regardless of whether they were on for any particular program or not, just having the TV. Well, then that became the share. What you're talking about, the share is uh, different from the rating. The rating is the entire population, regardless of whether it's on or off. The share is the percentage of that is watching during that time period. So it's just the on portion. Well, how did they know this? How did they know whose was on? Uh, well, they used, Nielsen came up with a device called the set meter. So he could electronically uh, make, put a little box on your set and they could watch it at, or Basically, the early ones were mail-in. They would have uh, uh, some of their uh, work staff come out, pick up the little uh, boxes that were recorded in, and then they would take them back and uh, look at what was recorded. Later on, they became instantaneous. They developed a new type of meter, which was instantaneous, so they could get even overnight ratings. But basically, it was um, uh, tying a uh, device, a meter, to your set-top box. Mm -hmm. gave them uh, an idea of who was watching or how so, many people were watching. Were people willing to do that? I mean, that, so what, what was the reception of, and, and what years was this when, when they were, and, and how did he- Well, he started in his service, I think in 1942, but that was Nielsen, that is, he started with radio and then when television wasn't yet a viable medium at that period, and then when television came along, he gradually moved into television ratings and uh, kind of uh, bested Hooper, who was his competitor uh, because of his incorporation of television ratings. Oh, okay. And so did Hooper make it through that challenge or? Well, yeah. Hooper had a unsuccessful and he uh, went fishing and he fell into the blades of a boat uh, propeller. <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up, so the uh, rest of Hooper ratings was sold to Nielsen, and so Nielsen kind of took over the field. Oh my gosh, that's, oh, oh, oh my, okay. Well, that's what, very interesting <laughs> over <laughs> this. So then, okay, so then who were these pioneers again? So we've talked about Hooper, now he's gone. Nielsen is probably the, the uh, got the most stay in power. Why does- Yeah, right, Nielsen is still kind of the uh, standard bearer today. Or the or first one was Crosley, Archibald Crosley that I mentioned. And uh, so he was kind of the first one to come up with the term rating. And then Hooper came along and he uh, came up with uh, the idea of 
using, um, well, he used quota sampling, but he came up with the idea of rating and share both and using them differently. And then when Nielsen came along, he came up with the idea of uh, projectable ratings because of that you could project uh, the rating to the entire population and find out exactly how many viewers you got and paid by paid based on the cost per thousand. So that was his innovation. So each of them had kind of different uh, things they innovated and became part of the standard vocabulary because early services, they were just very hodgepodge. Nobody had the same ratings, they weren't comparable, etc. So they kind of standardized a vocabulary that the whole ratings industry used. Okay, so take us to the next step. So did, did the terminology start and, and the methods, did they start to change out uh, into the tel So we understand it started with the radio. Now we're into the television. Okay. So how can you meet, take us along the changes that, that occurred in the next phase? Okay. Well, I think the um, one of the moving along from television, of course, the addition of cable was a huge change uh, because then they had to incorporate the cable television audience. Well, the cable, if you think about it, a cable rating is not the same as a TV rating because cable audience is smaller than the entire television audience. So uh, if you're, so they had to uh, create a, you know, new rating for cable ratings because uh, of the base being different, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, I believe only, I think there's something like 10 or 15% of homes that have, or don't have cable and then Currently, there's a big issue with people dropping cable altogether and going to the streaming services. So um, they've had a huge turnover with people who feel that cable is too expensive, you know, and have dropped off and moved to entirely um, streaming services. So um, the cable audiences sort of vary, but uh, that's a big issue today is um, the departure of the audience for streaming services. But so that was another big thing. The other big change, I think, was the um, change to digital. I don't know, probably a lot of the ordinary public didn't follow this, but in 2000, um, just after 2000, the whole television, you know, it was over the air, you know, broadcasting was over the air. The whole idea, you had an antenna on your roof and uh, you picked up the signals, everything. Well, that all shifted when television went completely digital. I believe it was 2000 and, um, nine or 10 or something around there. And um, so uh, now everything, you can still get a digital antenna and get the digital signals over the air, but uh, that was another sh big shift for television. They ended up selling off a lot of the airwaves to telephone um, antenna sites or you know cell phone sites. So uh, now it's completely digital television. So that was another shift oh, and it's also affected measurement. Uh, okay, so what uh, oh, did that make it easier? Well, um, if you think about cable and the uh, what are called the uh, set top devices today, like um, if you get a, a streaming device or they have to put a what's called a set top device on your set, right? So you might get a TiVo or something and then you get a box and you attach that cable, you had to get a box and attach that. So all these set top boxes uh, originally were one way. They just recorded what you were watching. Mm -hmm. But um, then they decide, came up with the idea of making them two way, meaning um, that you could, you know, so you, they could get, well, it was, you, they could get information both ways. So the result was they began to incorporate these um, set top box viewing as a way of replacing uh, some of the other methodology they had used. But of course, the problem is that not everybody has the interactive set-top box because a lot of the old set-top boxes are still in use and were just one way. So they couldn't get data back. So, um, so basically that's been another made shift is playing around with how to get a more accurate data. They also used uh, a method called diaries, which you may have gotten a diary in the mail at some point. Uh, well, originally they were um, considered an excellent device and when you had like a five station market or uh, early on, but now with cable and, you know, over channels, uh, they've also become kind of uh, questionable and 
the industry is always some kind of looking for a new method to try to um, handle the uh, multi platforms they have to measure today. Another key issue, of course, is the telephone. Then, uh, right, even today, they have figured out how to include, if you're watching on your, your uh, cell phone, how to include that in the ratings. So that's another big issue for them. And the iPad. And the iPad. is another one of those, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, any laptop device too. Yeah. All right, so what is what has happened um, as far as the Nielsen, um, that the, he was, is he is Nielsen? I know Mr. Nielsen has gone on probably, but is uh, Nielsen a major rating service? Who's doing all of this work? I mean, it's still Nielsen. Nielsen, the Nielsen family um, themselves, who started the whole thing, um, sold the business way back. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, the, the original one, died. His son ran the business, Arthur Nielsen Jr., for about ten years, and then he sold it to. Uh, at the time, I think it was done in Bradstreet. And now it's run by uh, private equity companies who have it managed. So, uh, but it's still kind of the uh, kingpin, if you will, of the rating services. Most uh, advertisers and um, broadcasters get some form of Nielsen ratings in order to, um, to determine how to sell. I mean, they need some kind of measure to sell advertising. So any advertising supported media uh, has to get some kind of rating system. Okay, so isn't that all media? Can you make a generalization that? No, all? not really. This Netflix, for example, that's, that doesn't have um, doesn't sell advertising. So, in fact, a lot of the newer media came out because it was a reaction. A lot of people didn't like advertising in their programming, so they wanted uh, ways of watching programming that they weren't interrupted by commercials. So Netflix was kind of um, key in that. Netflix was sort of interesting. It began uh, as a subscription service. You may remember in the mail, you, you would get the, you would mail the Netflix things back and forth in the mail. And that yeah. because Reed Hastings, the founder of the company was annoyed when you used to have the um, uh, video companies. Remember the stores where you go in and you get your DVDs or videos, bring them home and watch them. He was angry at the late fees he had to pay. <laughs> so he created a service where there were no late fees. And that's when he started the mail and mail. You can still do this, I think, with uh, Netflix. You can get them by mail and then put them in your DVD or whatever. Uh, but that was the origins of Netflix. And the whole basis was uh, not watching commercials. So um, one would question, why does uh, a company like um, Netflix even need uh, rating services such as Nielsen because they don't sell advertising and the basis of most ratings is to sell advertising. Yeah, that would be the question. Same thing for HBO. HBO um, too, yes. Okay, so I mean, their big blockbusters have been paid for by, well, like Game of Thrones, where, um, who pays for that? I, whatever foundations or whatever resources they use are different from that's how, how they a lot of them are part of some big multi conglomerate they, and they have resources from other areas they can use. And Netflix has been so successful that it's become um, also a major uh, producer of programming in its own right. So the entire budgeting process, the, all the fiscal matters are in now like a corporation running. Right. Exactly. Many, yeah. Marketing in many, many more ways that they busted out of this niche, right? That's right. A really important niche. All right, so somebody like, um, okay, this is also HBO. And in fact, as you know, Bill Maher is coming again after being away for a while yeah. to for the New Year's Eve celebration. But um, so same thing, right? He's, he's not got advertising at all. So he's- No, no HBO is on, also a non-advertising medium. And if you remember TiVo, I don't know if you ever had a TiVo, but that was the whole basis of TiVo was to eliminate commercials from your program. It would tape it and then you could uh, go through the commercials. You didn't have to watch the commercials because uh, commercial television got really bad with, and even sometimes you can see this today where they break up the program every two seconds and somebody yeah. will be in sentence and they go to a commercial or something. So uh, people got really sick of the commercials. So um, I think that created a lot of this 
um, push toward creating a uh, services that were commercial oriented. Right. Well, um, so, okay, then that gets to the question of, I was gonna ask you about the power of media ratings and, and, that indus and the industry to influence what is our media. Does that- well, okay. uh, It's very powerful because um, it, it is a determinant uh, for advertisers uh, what programs they buy, you know, like uh, they try to buy programs that match their products. The key demographic is the 18 to 49 group for advertisers. So that means if you're over 49, most of the programmings aren't designed for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or if you're under 18. So uh, <laughs> that affects the type of programming that we see. So we're not seeing any really programming for older people or younger people that much, except for maybe PBS, which is its own uh, separate commercials or did. It's kind of sliding them in now with sponsorship. But basically, that was the whole idea behind PBS was not to have sponsorships. So that would influence the programming. So um, so it's been uh, a major, um, I think, a shift toward um, moving toward these non-commercial programs. And TiVo, I think, was very influential, although I read recently that they've sold TiVo to some other company who wants to use the technology for something else. So I'm not sure what will happen with that. Very interesting to, to follow that up. Well, then, then, then what for the meeting, media ratings or the media rating industry? So tell me what you see as the key issues for them today. Obviously, this marketing. Well, it's kind of interesting to note, I don't know, recently uh, Nielsen was decredited both for the national ratings and the local ratings, uh, dur because during the pandemic, they reported a decline in programming in February of last year, which um, during the COVID crisis. So this did not make sense to a lot of people because you know you would think most people were at home watching more television, not less television. So uh, basically, they um, kind of came out with the idea that reason that the numbers went down is that Nielsen employs a staff of employees who go out into the field to make sure that their meters are working and so forth and during the pandemic they did not send them out so there was a concern that there was a lot of people who had left their homes wherever they were and so they were not recording uh they were recording nothing on their television during that time because they maybe went to the country they had a home in the city or something like that so um, so that affected the lower ratings, they believe. So the result was that Nielsen today just got um, accredited by the accreditation association called the Media Ratings Council, both nationally and locally because of this blip with the pandemic. Um, similarly, they've just come out, I think, and today with this new thing called the, the gauge, which is going to be interesting. That's just developed. It's a way of using a router somehow to record programming and what mm -hmm. they're trying to do which was the kind of the goal is to get all all types of services measured by the same device and use the same base so they could be truly comparable so but then that, that, that would boost the validity and reliability of the right the right so um so even um netflix has sort of on board with this because they use this kind of router based technology and according to what they found for the first time was 60% um, of the audience viewership was watching still watching cable and television 26% was watching streaming and the rest of the audience was watching kind of those 9% like video games and stuff like that. Oh, so, right. um, and the top ratings company, which was sort of or streaming companies, were um, YouTube and uh, Netflix. Mm -hmm. Getting the most streaming. That is very interesting. What now? One more question, and then we're going to be needing to close. But um, and what is the most important thing they want to find out through these ratings today? Can you? Can uh, you yes, I think uh, probably the most important thing they would like to uh, implement them see if the people who are watching these commercials actually buy the products that they're watching. 
So to somehow tie it to uh, product usage, that's kind of really their overall arching goal. It's like so you saw a commercial on some type of shoes. Can they somehow, uh, a lot of them are in retail businesses as well. Can they somehow tie this to uh, you're going out and buying those shoes? So that's kind of what they're looking for is how effective was the commercial? Did you actually buy their product after you watched it? So that is what uh, is so interesting is that it's co really commercial. Commercial is, is the theme quite through and, and it's not quality. No, uh, in fact, that's what I was saying. The idea of ratings as invented by Crosley, he said was a misnomer because people thought popularity meant quality, you know, that it was some measure of quality. In fact, it's only a measure of quantity, you know, and they're not necessarily related because different day parts have different numbers of viewer watching. So you're going to have higher ratings at night, for example, because more people are at home than during the day. So ratings are only measures of uh, quantity during the time period that they're being used or watched. Uh, so um, it's kind of different, I think, than people assume that it's a measure of quality, but it's not. Well, um, it, it's aloha time for us here and we'll have to wrap it up. But I mean, we've been talking with Dr. Karen Buzzard about the origins and development of media ratings and that industry. And I believe we've learned a lot about what media ratings are and are not and what they do. And it's really quite simple, isn't it? It's, it's, it's about um, whether there's a commercial gain out of it. So. Um, maybe in the future, there'll be something more complex that can get more information about quality. But thank you um, for all of this information, Karen, and it's very stimulating. And I hope that, you know, it helps us just understand better what, what's going on since we're all involved in media watching and maybe this can help us make it the best it can be for ourselves. Uh, and at least know what it really is and what it isn't when we get recommendations. But I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, your host for this show, The State of the State of Hawaii. I'll see you again in two weeks and mahalo for your attention. Everyone, please have a very happy Thanksgiving this week. Aloha. Mm -hmm.